So turn to the book of of Revelation, chapter 11. The majority of chapter 11 is what scholars refer to as an interlude. I'm spending a lot of time on this because you need to understand the structure of the book of Revelation if you don't want to get confused. The majority of this portion that we're going to be in, chapter 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, are interludes. So you need to understand that. In literature, an interlude is what we would refer to as parenthetical information. In other words, the author is interrupting the chronological flow of events in order to give you additional information that he thinks you need to know. It's kind of like filling in the gaps. You see, as these events are unfolding, as I said, in chronological order, other things are happening. So from time to time, John wants to take a time out and he wants to fill you in on what is happening or what has already happened during these events. Now, if you remember, between the sixth and the seventh seal, there was an interlude. Because after the sixth seal was opened and a polar axis shift occurred, a question was asked. Who can survive the great day of God's wrath? So before moving on to the seventh seal, John took a time out to explain that 144,000 Jews would be sealed. And because of that sealing, they would be protected from the wrath of God. And John is going to do the same thing between the sixth And the seventh trumpet judgment. After the sixth trumpet and before moving on to the seventh trumpet judgment, he's going to take a time out to explain a few things. You see, as I said two weeks ago, the seventh trumpet begins the second half of the tribulation. Now, I don't know about you, but I have the tendency to look at things and based on the symmetry, I judge where it's at. Does that make sense? And so if we looked at this chart up here, we wouldn't be able to tell that we're in the middle of the tribulation. But we have to keep certain things in mind. The tribulation does not start until after the rapture. It starts when the first seal is opened. So you need to think of the tribulation as starting right here, not all the way back here. Does that make sense? Right now, we are living in what is known as the church age, this period of time. So the tribulation will start when the first seal is opened, and it will end after the battle of Armageddon. This is the millennium period. So if you go from this point to this point, you can see on the chart that we're about halfway through. But that's not why, just by looking at the chart that I said, we're halfway in the tribulation. I showed you two weeks ago why we're at that midpoint. But because we are at that midpoint, John needs to fill you in on a few things. He wants to prepare you for the second half of the tribulation. And he wants to explain some of the things that happened during the first half of the tribulation. Such as the temple being rebuilt and the two witnesses prophesying. So chapters 10 and 11 up to verse number 14 is an interlude. Is everyone with me so far? Good. So turn to Revelation chapter 11. Let's read verses 1 and 2. Then I was given a measuring stick, and I was told, Go and measure the temple of God in the altar, and count the number of worshipers, but do not measure the outer courtyard, for it has been turned over to the nations. They will trample the holy city for 42 months. Daniel, Jesus, and Paul all prophesied that the temple would be rebuilt sometime during the first half of the tribulation. In fact, Daniel chapter 9, verse number 27 tells us that when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he is going to negotiate a seven-year covenant with Israel. This covenant is going to be an Israeli-Palestinian Peace treaty. It will not only guarantee peace for Israel, but it will also allow the Jews to rebuild the temple on the site that is known as Mount Moriah. How many of you have ever heard of the term Mount Moriah? What is Mount Moriah? Well, that's also what we refer to as the Temple Mount. Mount Moriah is where Abraham took Isaac in order to sacrifice him to God. And if you remember the story in Genesis chapter 2, He bound Isaac, he laid him upon the altar, he drew back his knife to slay him, and God said, stop. I know that you're willing to sacrifice your son for me. And he substituted a ram in his place. Where that happened is at Mount Moriah. 
Now, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is Mount Moriah. The temple was built over that site. Now, the temple that John is told to measure here in Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, is the temple that is going to be rebuilt during the first half of the tribulation. It is part of the seven-year peace treaty that the Antichrist is going to negotiate between Israel and the Palestinians. But in order to get both sides to agree, a major compromise will have to be made on both sides. Now here's what's interesting, and you're going to know something that 99% of the people in the world today don't know. John tells us what that major compromise is going to be in verse number 2. Did you know that? All of these presidents are trying to negotiate a peace treaty between the Palestinians and Israel. Are we going to make a Palestinian state? What are we going to do? How are we going to divide the land up? Here's the interesting thing. Almost 2,000 years ago, God said in his word what's going to be the key to making this covenant or this peace treaty work. And it's found in verse number 2. Look at the first part of verse 2. But do not measure the outer courtyard, for it has been turned over to the nations. Now notice that John was specifically told not to measure the outer courtyard. Why? Because it has been turned over to the nations. I want you to underline that phrase, turned over. It's translated from the Greek word, didami. Didami is how you would say it, which means to give. You see, the Jews are going to give the outer courtyard to the Arabs as a compromise. They're going to receive something and they're going to return and give peace in, 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 instead. So in return, they're going to get peace and the right to rebuild the temple minus the outer courtyard. So let's talk about this compromise and what it means to both parties. For the Jews, it means they get to rebuild the major part of the temple. The only thing that they're going to have to give up is the outer courtyard. Now, to understand what that is, let me explain the different parts of the temple. Because the majority of us aren't familiar with the temple, especially in the Old Testament and at the time of Jesus. So let me just kind of explain the different parts of it. Solomon's temple, and also the temple during Jesus' period, consisted of a structure that housed the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. In fact, let me just show this to you. I'm going to see if he can zoom in on this. Can we do that? Can everyone see this? If not, you're not going to see it up there. This is a picture of the Temple Mount at the time of Jesus Christ. It's what we think it looked like. Now, this is actually the temple. They would have considered all of this from this wall here as part of the temple. But this structure housed the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. Now, if you remember, the Holy Place had certain articles of furniture in it. Like the showbread in it, the altar of incense, the menorah. But then you had a curtain that separated the Holy of Holies, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that supposedly is where, not supposedly, that is where God came down, and his presence was there. And on the great day of atonement, the only time that the high priest was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies to make an atonement for the people, that's where he would go. This structure was surrounded by four courtyards. The court of the priest, which contained the brass altar. If you want to see it, it's right there inside. You can come out afterwards and take a look at it. But it contained the brass altar where the sacrifices and the offerings were burnt. And only the priest were allowed to come into this courtyard. Then you had the court of the Israelites. This court was separated by three steps, not a wall. You actually climb three steps to get to the court of the priest. All Jewish men who were ceremonially clean were allowed into this courtyard. Then you had the court of the women. The court of the women is where Jewish women could go. It's this part inside here. They could bring their sacrifices. In fact, the priest would actually come down. They could lay their hands upon the sacrifice. They would confess their sins, but the priest would then take it back to the priest of the courtyard to be able to slay it. They could not enter into the court of the Israelites. I'm sorry, it just wasn't allowed. And last but not least, you had the outer courtyard. That is the court of the Gentiles. Gentiles who were considered to be God-fearing men could enter into this courtyard. Now the term God-fearing, the King James says 
God fears is how they do it, applied to Gentiles who believed in Judaism, believed in the one God of Judaism, but who hadn't been circumcised. The reason they were referred to as God fears rather than Judea, uh, rather than Jews is because you had to be circumcised to be a Jew. Now it was easier for a woman to become a Jew than a man, and you can understand why. So many times Gentile men would worship God and believe in God, but they wouldn't be circumcised. We see an example of this in the book of Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through 2. In Caesarea there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and he prayed regularly to God. Now, God-fearing men could enter the court of the Gentiles, but they couldn't go any further. If you remember when Paul got in trouble, it's because he was accused to bring a Gentile past the court of the Gentiles, which is this area, and inside to the court of the women and on towards the court of the Israelites. Did he do it? No. He didn't do it. But they accused him of doing that, and they got all upset. There used to be a little plaque that would actually tell the Gentiles that if you entered in past the court of the Gentiles, into the court of the women, or into the court of the Israelites, then you would be punished by death. Does that make sense? All right. So let me show you all the parts of the temple. Let's uh, put that slide up. Do we have it? This kind of tells you what it looked like. Here you have the the big structure that was enclosed that you had the Holy of Holies, and here's the curtain. And then you had the holy place, which is where you had the article of furniture like the menorah, the showbread, uh, the golden uh, altar of incense. And then right here was the laver. This was the court of the priest. You can see that. Here's the altar. Here's the laver. And then there were steps coming down, and this little part was the court of the Israelites. The men could come here. This is the court of the women, and then all around this, a little bit larger than what that is showing, is what? That's the court of the Gentiles. Now, this is very important because the Jews are going to be allowed to rebuild the temple with one exception. They're not going to be allowed to rebuild the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. That area is going to be given to the Gentiles the Muslims, as part of the compromise. And without the outer outer court wall being built, the Jews and the Muslims will be able to share the Temple Mount. You see, right now, this is a bone of contention. Right now, the Jews are upset with their government, those who want to rebuild the Temple, because they want to go up there and cast all the Muslims down. And the Muslims are like, just see if you can. And it's kind of interesting. When we went to Israel this last summer... It took about 30 minutes to get up to the Temple Mount. And the guide, surely you can remember this, they weren't going to allow him to come up. And some of the people were going, well, I don't know if we should go up if they're not going to let our guide because they were getting all upset. You can't take a Bible up there. You're not allowed to go up there and pray because they're afraid that's going to offend the Muslims and there's going to be some problems up there. And so they were detaining him and everyone was saying, I don't know whether we should go or not. I just told them this. I know where our hotel is, guys. If he doesn't come, I'm going to the Temple Mount. And so he finally got through, we went up to the Temple Mount, but the interesting thing about it is you can't take a Bible up there. You can't pray up there because there is so much tension. Now, who is in control of it? Well, actually, the Palestinian Authority is supposed to be in control of it, but the Jewish people, the guards are there. And what's interesting is, The Muslims can enter any of the gates to get to the Temple Mount, but the Christians and the Jews can only come, and most Jews won't go up there, and the reason they won't is because they're afraid of the Holy of Holies. But they must enter in through one gate only, and it's a high security area. And when you get up there, you will see all of these Israeli soldiers, and they don't just have one gun. They've got a gun and an Uzi and a rifle, and I mean they are packed. They've got a bulletproof vest on, and they mean business. And it's because the tension is so great there. But there's going to be a compromise. And the compromise is that we are going to give you, or they're going to allow them to build the temple with the exception of the court of the Gentiles. And as a result, the Dome of the Rock and the temple is going to be able to coexist on the Temple Mount. 
And both sides will agree to this, and that's the compromise. Now, most people think that this is impossible because they've been taught that the Dome of the Rock was built directly over the original site of Solomon's temple, which means that the Dome of the Rock is going to have to be torn down before the Jews can rebuild the temple. Why? Because the Jews won't rebuild the temple unless they can build it over the original site. That would be an abomination. It has to be rebuilt on the exact original site. So most of us have been taught that the Dome of the Rock and the temple cannot coexist upon the Temple Mount. As long as the Dome of the Rock exists, the temple can't be built. So the Dome of the Rock is going to have to be torn down. How many of you have been taught that? I mean, you ever heard of this? Okay. Well, I'm going to burst your bubble if you've been taught that. Yes, it's true. For 13 centuries, people have believed that the Dome of the Rock was built on the original site of Solomon's temple. But most archaeologists no longer believe that. Asher Kaufman argues that the ancient Holy of Holies was not located where the Dome of the Rock is. Instead, it stood approximately 100 yards north of the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount. And at first, most archaeologists disagreed with him. But not anymore. In fact, that's why the Jews are so excited and are getting things ready to have the third temple rebuilt. You see, extensive research under the Temple Mount has revealed a cistern that was located between the temple porch and the altar of sacrifice. What most of us don't know is that there's a whole network of tunnels underneath the temple mount. In fact, we got to go through the rabbinical tunnels, and it was just a wonderful thing to be able to do, but you could see where there were other tunnels that were sealed off that were going underneath the temple mount. In fact, when you're going through the Old Testament and it talks about some of the kings that were able to escape, the reason they could escape is because there were secret tunnels underneath the temple mount. And there was this whole network of tunnels and rooms underneath the temple mount. And so when they started doing extensive research under this, they found this cistern. And it was located, this was the cistern that was located between the temple porch and the altar of sacrifice. The discovery of this cistern confirms the fact that the Holy of Holies is north of the Dome of the Rock. In fact, an imaginary perpendicular line from the sealed eastern gate to the west wall would intersect the middle of the Holy of Holies if the temple was built on the original site. And here's what's kind of interesting. Even though they thought that the Dome of the Rock was originally built on the original site, they knew from ancient writings that the eastern wall was supposed to go perpendicular to the western wall right through the middle of the Holy Holies, and it didn't do it. So they had guessed that they had moved the wall, but they found out they hadn't moved the wall. They had just gotten it wrong where the Holy of Holies were, or was. Now, what this means is that the temple can be built on its original site without disturbing the Dome of the Rock. In fact, the Dome of the Rock sits in the area known as the Outer Court, the Court of the Gentiles, which is why John was told not to measure the Outer Court, because it will be what? Given to the nations as part of a compromise. Don't measure it. It's part of the compromise. It will be given to them. Now, let me show you where the temple is going to be built. I'm going to show you some of my pictures from Israel. You know, don't you love seeing those? This is the Dome of the Rock. It is truly a magnificent sight. Isn't that a beautiful picture of my wife? She just loves this. But actually, this is from the eastern side, a little bit northeastern. I thought about giving you a lot of pictures, but I was afraid I would overwhelm you. You actually come up, the one gate that you're allowed to come up to is the eastern side. So you're between the two mosques that sit on the Temple Mount. One is kind of a learning institute. And the Dome of the Rock, they still use to come in and they hold services there. And you'll see some of the Muslims coming in there. But this is the eastern side of it. Now, north of that is a big vacant area. In fact, let's go to the second and third ones, not the third yet, but this is north of the Dome of the Rock. And I don't know if you can see this, but notice how small these people are. Can you see that? People, this is a huge area north of the temple. I mean, of the Dome of the Rock. It is a huge expanse. You could put a football field and more in there. Now, go to the next one if you don't mind. 
This is actually looking from the Dome of the Rock back towards kind of the north and northeast. There's my mom and there's Shirley. There's a couple from Alabama and they talk like they were from Alabama. But you can see when you start looking at the size, she probably still has another 30, 40 yards to walk before she's over to the very end. But you can see how huge this area is. More than enough room to build the temple without disturbing the Dome of the Rock. Now here's three good pictures that kind of puts this all in perspective. This is the first one. Here's the Dome of the Rock. It's huge. But what's interesting is when you take the dimensions of the temple, this literally can go further out. The temple mount continues on through here. These are just gates, but they continue on out. And so all of this gives you room. Let's go on to the next picture, if you don't mind. Here's the eastern gate. Now, what's kind of interesting about this is that there's actually a gate underneath this. This has been built upon, and, and this is not the original temple mount because they just kept building on top of it. But what's kind of interesting is... They thought they'd gotten this wrong. And the reason they thought they'd gotten this wrong is because they thought that Solomon's temple should have been here. So they figured they got it wrong until they did excavation. They said, no, they built it in the exact right place. Perpendicular from the eastern gate back to the western wall would be the temple. And it would sit right here. It would go through the middle of the Holy of Holies. Let's hit the third picture if you don't mind. This is the southern part. This, we're... We were actually standing when we took this picture on the Mount of Olives. And from the Mount of Olives, we're looking down, and it's so big, it's hard to get this picture all in. But here's the Dome of the Rock, and this is the southern part. And you can see how huge this is. In fact, the Bible talks about the Israelites having to come back for three festivals, and people would always wonder, how in the world could you get all these people in Jerusalem and, and, and actually fulfilled the Feast of Passover. But Josephus and some of the other historians tell us that over 250,000 people would fit at one time upon the Temple Mount. That's how big it is. So what this is telling us, when he tells him to measure the temple, but he says, don't measure the courtyard. Don't measure the outer court because that is to be given to the Gentiles. In other words, it's going to be part of the compromise and the temple is going to be built up there and the dome of the rock is going to be able to stay at the same time. The two are going to be able to coexist. Now, how many of you think the Muslims will go for this? How many think the Muslims won't go for this? That they won't allow the Jews to rebuild the temple there? Well, if you ask most people, they say, no. But I'm going to tell you that they will. And I'll explain why. They're going to go for it because when the Antichrist comes on the scene, they're going to think that he's the 12th Imam. How many of you have ever heard of the 12th Imam? Do you know who the 12th Imam is? Well, let me give you a little lesson on Muslims. This is a lesson that every child in America should be taught in grade school, junior high, and high school, because we watch the news, we don't understand the Middle East, we think that every Muslim is the same, but we don't understand their culture. So let me give you some information you really need to know, and I'm going to make it as brief as possible. Muslims are divided into two groups, Shiites and Sunnis. Both Sunni and Shiite Muslims share the most fundamental Islamic beliefs and articles of faith. The difference between the two is not spiritual, but political. And the difference dates all the way back to the death of the prophet Muhammad and the question of who was supposed to take over the leadership after his death. Shiites believe that following the death of Muhammad, leadership should have passed directly to his family, and more specifically his son-in-law, Ali. The term Shiite Ali means party of Ali. The Sunnis believe that following the death of Muhammad, the leader of the Muslim nation was to be elected from the most qualified. Those who were most qualified to guard the Islamic faith and protect the Islamic state. So you see these two divisions today. You go into Iraq and you see Shiites are killing Sunnis and Sunnis are killing Shiites. But the reason they're doing this is this is more political than it is spiritual. But at the same time, these political beliefs have kind of splintered off and caused these little differences in their fundamental beliefs. But not generally as a whole. And you need to understand that. So from the time of Muhammad's death until now, the Sunnis believe in the authority of the elected leader. 
Does that make sense? So when you go to nations, Muslim nations that have a leader that's been elected, it's because the majority of the Muslims there are what? Sunnis. But when you go to nations where the majority are Shiites, they don't believe in that. That's why the Atola Khomeini could come in Iran. They did not want the Shah. The majority in Iran and Iraq are Shiites. The only reason Saddam Hussein, who was a Sunni, could keep the Shiites, in a sense, in control is because he dominated them. And once they took him out, and most Americans didn't know this. So when we took out... Saddam Hussein, that allowed the Sunnis who are the majority, I'm sorry, the Shiites who are the majority to begin to persecute the Sunnis. And that's why you see the Iranians who are so, they're, they're coming in and, and, and they are supporting and they're training the Shiites to go in there and cause this because they don't believe you can elect the authority. No, you can't do that. Now, The Sunnis contend that leadership of the Muslim nation is not a birthright, but a trust that is earned and which may be given or taken away by the people themselves. And people, that's the major difference between the Sunnis and the Shiites with one exception. Because the Shiites believe that leadership should have stayed within the Prophet's own family, they believe in what is known as the 12th Imam. Now both Sunnis and Shiites believe in a Muslim Messiah. And that when the Muslim Messiah comes, the day of judgment, or he will come and usher in the day of judgment. Let me say it like that. But the Shiites believe in what is known as the 12th Imam. Now, let me explain who the 12th Imam is. Muhammad is reported to have said that the Islamic leadership was to remain in his tribe and that 12 Imams would succeed him. These imams would be the spiritual and political successors to Muhammad. They would also be sinless, infallible humans that would rule over the Muslim nation with justice. The first imam was Ali, the son-in-law of Muhammad. He was followed by the male descendants of Muhammad through his daughter, Fatima Zahra, who was the wife of Ali, of course. And then each imam would be the son of the previous imam. The twelfth and final imam is Muhammad al-Mahdi. How many of you ever heard of him? Anyone ever heard of him? Muhammad al-Mahdi. Well, where is he? Well, let's talk about this. Because this is where it gets interesting. When the Muhammad al-Mahdi, Ma, let me say that again. Muhammad al-Mahdi's father died. He was the eleventh imam on January the 1st, 874 AD. That's when he died. January the 1st. His five-year-old son disappeared from the funeral. Now, the Shiites believe that he is still alive today, and he is in hiding. In fact, what's kind of interesting is when the 11th imam died Imam died in 874 AD, the uncle was actually doing the eulogy at the funeral, and supposedly, according to tradition, his five-year-old son, the imam's son, came and told him he had no authority to be there. He had no authority to do that. And he prayed this beautiful prayer. And after the prayer, he disappeared. He was gone. And they believe, the Shiites do, that he's still alive today and he's in hiding. And that he is the Messiah and he's being hidden by God until the day of judgment. Now, according to Shiite Muslims, the 12th Imam will appear right before the end of the world. His appearance will be preceded by a time of world chaos. Now, of course, the Iran, uh, Iran, Iran, Iran's president, I'm not even going to try and pronounce his name since I had a problem with just Iran. <laughs> he is a Shiite, and he is committed to bringing about the return of the 12th Imam. And that is why he is not afraid of a nuclear war. In fact, he thinks that it's his responsibility to bring this chaos that is going to bring, uh, bring forth this 12th Imam. They also believe, talking about Shiites, that the 12th Imam will rule over the Arabs and the world for seven years. And Jesus, who the Muslims recognize as a prophet, is going to be by his side. Jesus is going to perform miracles to show the truth of their mission to bring justice and peace to the world. 
And they expect the 12th imam to bring peace and justice by the sword if necessary. In other words, through force if necessary. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but the 12th imam looks a lot like the Antichrist. And their version of Jesus is the exact replica of what the book of Revelation talks about, the false prophet. So what I'm telling you is this. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, the Shiite Muslims are going to believe that he's the 12th imam. The Sunnis are going to accept him as the Muslim Messiah. That's why the Antichrist is going to be able to negotiate this peace treaty with Israel. And there, he's going to be able to convince the Muslim leaders to allow Israel to rebuild the temple. In fact, let me show you something that's really interesting. And now, what I'm going to show you is fact. But when I finish showing you, I'm going to give you my personal opinion, all right? Let's do that. If you remember in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of this huge statue. Do you remember when we were talking about that? The statue was made up of five different materials. Gold, silver, bronze, iron, and iron mixed with clay. The different materials represented five different kingdoms that would rule over Israel, beginning with Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Now remember that four of the empires actually existed and then there was a break in time. The first one, of course, was Babylon. The second one was, of course, the Persian Medes, right? The third was Greece. And the fourth was who? Rome. And then there's this break in time, and he talks about the fifth kingdom that's going to rule at the end of the world. We saw that as the revived Roman Empire. This fifth and last kingdom is going to rule in the last days. Daniel told us that the Antichrist is going to rule over this last kingdom, which is this confederation of ten Roman or revived Roman countries. This kingdom was represented by the feet and the toes of the statue. So I want you to turn with me to the book of Daniel chapter 2, verses 41 through 42, and I'm going to show you something interesting. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron... The kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes and the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Now, as I said, the fifth kingdom is represented by the feet and toes of the statue. It consisted of iron mixed with clay. Because some of the nations that's going to be in this confederation will be strong, but the other nations, or some of the other nations, are going to be weak. But the common denominator is going to be the religion. That's what's going to hold them together. I want you to notice the phrase, iron mixed with clay. That is how he described this fifth kingdom. The last kingdom at the end of days. Now here's what's interesting. It said it would be iron mixed with clay. The word mixed is translated from the Hebrew word Arab. I'm not making it up. In fact, let's go ahead and switch to this if you don't mind. This is Daniel 2 verse number 43. You see this word mixed? It appears three times in these verses. Let's see if I can do this. And where is that size? Iron mixed with clay. Now let me just show you something so you can tell I'm not mixing this up. The word mixed, when it comes in, is translated the Hebrew word Arab. Now let me go a little bit further. If you do an etymology study on this word, you will find that the root of the word, the noun, means desert. When it is a proper noun, it means Arabia. When Israel was delivered out of Egypt, Moses went down. We remember the plagues. He delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. It says that a mixed multitude came with them. Guess what the word mixed is? Arab. Arabs came with them. Now, here's what's interesting. This word is only used as a verb three times in the Old Testament, and they really didn't know how to translate this. 
And the reason they didn't know how to translate this is because the common word for mixed in Hebrew is bala, not Arab. But the interesting thing is here is that he's telling us that the Arabs' religion, Islam, is what will be the common denominator holding the iron and the clay together. Holding these nations together. That is the mixture. That's what will intertwine them. The Arabs. Here's something interesting that you don't know. They feel like... I shouldn't say feel like. They don't feel like at all. They believe. They believe that the world is supposed to be an Islamic world. And that it is their job to convert it. And the reason we're the great devil, the reason we're the great demon is because we're against everything that the Quran teaches. And they want to convert us. And they realize that they had a problem. So one of the ways that they feel like they can convert it is they want their people to actually go in and immigrate to other countries. And they're doing this all over Europe. In fact, if you watch Fox Business News, you'll see that Britain wouldn't actually allow Wilder, who's coming from Amsterdam, who's done this little uh, video upon how violent the Muslims are. And they won't even let him in England because they're afraid of what it's going to cause. But the reason he's doing that is because all of the European nations are growing so fast with Muslims. They're immigrating to these countries and have been doing that. So they're not going to be the minority. They're going to become the majority. That's why France has had such a problem with the teenagers. Who do you think those teenagers they're having problems with are? They're Muslims. You go to all the European countries. The ones they're having the problems with are the Arabs. This is what God was trying to tell us. He was trying to say this last kingdom's going to come up and it's going to be a confederation of the revived Roman Empire. Some of them are going to be strong. Some of them are going to be weak. That's why some of them are iron. Some of them are clay. But he said they're going to be mixed. And then he went further and said their seed's going to be mingled. That's really interesting. But what he's talking about there is he says the thing that's going to intertwine them, the thing that's going to hold them together is the Islamic faith because it won't be long when they're not they're not going to be the minority they're going to become the majority that's why the antichrist will be able to convince the muslims to agree to a peace treaty with israel and allow them to rebuild the temple on the temple mount because those nations the revived roman empire will have a majority of muslims in them and they will believe that the Antichrist is the 12th Imam. The Shiites will believe that. That's what's going to take place. Does that make sense? All right. Go study that out. It's really interesting. Now, turn back to Revelation chapter 11, verse 2, and I want you to notice the last part. But do not measure the outer courtyard, for it has been turned over to the nations. God's already decreed it. We're going to give it to them. That's how we're going to get to build the temple. Then he goes further. They, who's he talking about? The nations, but who he's referring to is Arabs. They will trample the holy city for 42 months. Daniel, Jesus, and Paul all told us that in the middle of the tribulation, and that's where we are at chapter 11. In chapter 11, we're in between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. We're getting ready to start the second half of the tribulation. We just finished the first half of the tribulation. As soon as the seventh angel sounds his trumpet, there will be no more delay. We saw that in Revelation chapter 10. It's now going to happen. We're in the second part of the tribulation. Now, Daniel, Jesus, and Paul all told us that in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist would enter the temple, declare himself to be God, and demand to be worshipped. This is known as the abomination that causes the desolation. Turn to Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. Now we usually shorten it and say the abomination of desolation. But actually the original translation should be the abomination that causes the desolation. Look in Daniel 9 27. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven. In the Hebrew it's heptads. That's no different than when we say decades. For us a decade is what? A period of 10 years. A heptad for them was a period of 7 years. 
Okay, for a period of one set of seven years. But after half of this time, three and a half years, he will put an end to the sacrifices and the offerings. They cannot offer sacrifices and offerings. In fact, if you have been reading your one-year Bible, what did you read today? You cannot kill in the town or out of the town. You cannot sacrifice any animal unless you bring it to the temple. So the sacrifices and offerings from the Mosaic sacrificial system has ceased until the temple is rebuilt. It says that this Antichrist is going to put an end to the sacrifices and offerings, which tells us that at the first part of the tribulation, the temple is going to be rebuilt. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him, which will be the battle of Armageddon. Now, look at Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 16, because Jesus also talked about this. When you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee unto the mountains. Leave, abandon the city. If you don't, you will die. At, and last but not least, look what Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Now as I said, when the Antichrist goes to the temple, this is referred to as the abomination that causes desolation. Now does everyone know what the word desolation means? Desolation means abandoned, deserted. To desolate means to abandon, to desert. You see, when this Antichrist enters the temple and declares himself to be God, the Jews are going to finally realize that they've been tricked. And they're going to flee for their lives. They will abandon the holy city. They will flee to the mountains. And when they flee, the city is going to be left to who? The Palestinians. Oh, they're going to grow even stronger because the 12th Imam, the Antichrist, look what he's done. And that is what is meant by they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Why does he say 42 months? And the word trample there, this is kind of interesting. In the book of Revelation, it means to tread down as a victor. They're now in control. You see, right now the Jews, they control Israel. I'm telling you, when we went to Jordan and Petra and we tried to get back in to the country, it was unbelievable. What did we, what'd we have to say there? Two, three hours? I'm telling you, it took forever. And here's what's interesting. We were all American citizens. They had those who were not Palestinians. They waited there as long as 8 to 12 hours to get in. That's how long it took. And the Jews were in control. But you know what's going to happen? It says they will trample the holy city. And the word trample means they're going to be victorious. They're going to conquer. They're going to be in control of the city. But it tells you how long. 42 months. How long is that? Three and a half years. Now when the Antichrist first comes on the scene, many of the Jews will think he's their Messiah. Oh my. Now this is personal belief. Now why do I think that? Well, as you know, Orthodox Jews reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And if you ask them why, this is what they'll tell you. Because he claimed to be the Son of God. And we don't believe that the Messiah is the Son of God. We believe that the Messiah will be a man and a man only. When we went to Israel, we went and talked with an Orthodox Jew. And it's one of the most interesting things. And he was talking about the difference between Jews and Christians. And he said, you know, you believe Jesus is the Messiah. We don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He claimed to be the Son of God. And we don't believe that the Messiah is going to be the Son of God. We believe that the Messiah is nothing more than a man. And then they give scripture to support their reason for believing that. They'll give you Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 15. Moses continued... The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And here's the reasoning. Moses was a man. The Messiah will be like Moses. So the Messiah must be a man. Now it doesn't dawn on them that the Bible teaches that Jesus was 100% man but 100% God. He emptied himself but that doesn't matter. 
Now, when a Christian first hears that, the, the question that normally pops in his mind is this. If you believe that the Messiah is a mere man, how will you know him? How will you recognize him? And so when I was there, they allowed us to ask questions. And so I just popped up my hand and said, are you looking for the Messiah? And if you are, what will he be like? And it was so interesting to listen because what he described is exactly what the Antichrist is going to be. Here's what they will say. They'll tell you that the Messiah will lead them, the Jews, in rebuilding the temple. And they'll give you three scriptures to support this. Isaiah 11.9, Micah 4.1, and Habakkuk 2.14 as support of their belief. Isaiah 11.9 says, Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. Micah 4.1 says, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all. Now, the mountain of the Lord's house, that's Mount Moriah. The Lord's house is the temple. The most important place of all. It will be raised above the other hills and people from all of the world will stream there to worship. Habakkuk 2.14 says, for as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of the Lord. And they believe that will not happen until the temple is rebuilt. So the Jews are looking for a man that will do three things. And the man that does these three things will be the Messiah. He will bring peace to Israel and Jerusalem. He will allow them to rebuild the temple. And he will make Jerusalem the most important place on the face of the earth. Which is going to be accomplished when you build the temple. Now I personally believe... That in this euphoria, they'll, over the, they'll overlook the fact that the Antichrist is not Jewish. They'll quote you Deuteronomy 18.15, which he will be like Moses. He'll become from your fellow Israelites. But you know, it's kind of interesting. They're just looking for a man who will allow them to rebuild the temple. And when the 12th imam comes, he's going to be the perfect thing. He's going to be what the Bible teaches all things to all people. To the, to the Muslims, he will be the 12th imam. To the Jews, he will be the man that allows them to rebuild the temple and brings peace. Now here's what's interesting. Paul said that for this man to appear, someone's going to have to be taken out of the way. There's only one group of people that will recognize who this person is. And they're going to be gone. 